Revelation chapter 5 was the main topic of our last study, and we didn't get all the way through, but we will finish in a future study. In this lesson, we will be doing some repeat and enlarge on the topic of the Messiah, Messiah's family tree, or the root of David, and Christ as the second Adam. As we've already uh, covered in previous lessons, Adam lost kingship or dominion to Satan. Christ came as the second Adam to redeem man because there was no, el no one else on earth or in heaven who could do it. Without Christ, we were or are doomed. But now there's hope. Let's start with Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8, 1-4. When Romans 8, 3 says the law was weak through the flesh, it means the law could not redeem me because of my sinful flesh because my flesh gives into sin. Therefore, Christ was sent to take on human flesh, to become one of us and live out the sinless life of a human being for the purpose of being our spotless kinsman redeemer. Now let's go to Luke 1 verse 35, where we will notice something interesting. Consider Adam's genealogy and how in Luke 3.38, Adam was called the Son of God. Well, let's see what Christ was called when he came into this world, according to Luke 1.35. And the angels answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Luke 1.35 Since Adam was called the Son of God at the beginning before sin, then if Jesus is also given the same designation uh, when he came the first time, then he must be the second Adam. Jesus came to recover what the first Adam lost. He came to take Adam's place to recover the crown, the territory, and lives of the human race. The Apostle Paul picks up on this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. In Romans 5, the Apostle Paul develops this idea of the, of the uh, two Adams. The first Adam lost his throne, territory, freedom, and eventually his life. The second Adam came and recovers it all. Christ, Christ is a quickening spirit, and he still has the same life-giving power as when on earth he healed the sick and spoke forgiveness to the sinners. He forgiveth all the iniquities. He healeth all the diseases. Psalms 103, verse 3. And that's taken from uh, Desire of Ages 270, paragraph 2. Through the Holy Spirit, he now works, quickening our sympathies, contrary to our sinful nature. We are dead in trespasses, but we can now become alive again in Christ. The truth can prove to be a quickening spirit. Being incorporated into the soul, 
it can become life and peace and assurance through faith and prayer. As we discussed before, in Revelation 22, verse 16, Christ is referred to as the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Here's an interesting question for you. Can I be someone's father and son? Uh, You're probably thinking that's not possible. You can't be both. Yet this verse is telling us Jesus is David's father and his son. How do we understand Jesus as being the father of David and the son of David? He's the father of David as God, the creator of Adam. And from Adam's genealogy came David. Jesus, in his human form, Jesus is the son of David, who became our close relative, our next of kin. So this shows that Jesus is God and he is also man. In Genesis, we have the story of Jacob's ladder, which should really be called the Lord's ladder. as in Genesis 28, verses 10 to 19. We have this ladder placed on the earth. The uppermost part of the ladder reaches to the highest heaven, and God is standing at the top of the ladder. What does the ladder represent? John 1, verses 51 says that the ladder represents Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said so, and notice how his angels are with him. So in what way does that ladder represent Jesus? For one thing, the bottom of the ladder represents the fact that Jesus is rooted on earth because he is now a human being along with us. Or in the time of Jacob, he was promised to become human like us. The top of the ladder represents the fact that Jesus is one with the Father. In other words, Jesus connects God with man and man with God. He connects divinity to humanity. He's the great connecting link or bridge between heaven and earth. He's both divine and human. So much for the idea that human priests can represent us before God. Two main problems with the idea of strictly human priests representing sinners before God. First, the priest himself is a sinner. Imagine a sinner goes before God and says, I'm here to represent a sinner. God will say, well, you're a sinner too. Secondly, a priest is only human, but In order to be a priest in the strictest sense of the word, you must be divine. Notice that this is not a reference to the symbolic Old Testament priests who were representing Christ because they were only symbols of Christ. We're talking about a real priest who can represent us before God and deal with the disease of sin a priest who is called Father. The Bible tells us clearly that one is your Father, which is in heaven, Matthew 23, verse 9. The book of generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Matthew 1, 1. We know Jesus was the son of David, but was he the son of Abraham too? The answer is most certainly yes. Let's look at John chapter 8, verses 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. John 8, 58. This seems like a reversal of Matthew 1, 1. So Jesus is the father of Abraham and the son of Abraham. He's the father of Abraham because he is God, and he is the son of Abraham because he is man. Could this be another way of looking at Revelation 1.8, the beginning, Alpha, and the end, Omega. Next, let's look at Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. Here we find a description of the relationship between the Father, Jesus, 
and us. Remember, we cannot come into the presence of God alone because we are sinners. We have come with or through Jesus, our representative. But when the fullness of the of time of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Galatians four verses four to five. According to Galatians four verses four to five, Christ came according to the sixty nine week or four hundred and eighty three year prophecy, which is part of the seventy week prophecy to redeem us sinners so we could be adopted and now called what sons of god continue with verses six to seven and because ye are sons god hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying abba father wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son and if a son then heir of god through christ galatians 4 6 to 7 does Galatians 4, 6-7 say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Has God poured out the Spirit of His Son in us according to this passage? Yes. Does this passage say that when we receive Jesus, we also become sons of God? Yes. So, God has jesus who is his son and he has us who are also his sons the question now is is jesus a son in the same sense as we are the answer is absolutely not there is only one who deserves to be called the divine son of god did you know that in the book of john Whenever John speaks of Christ as being a son of God, he uses the Greek word huios, uh, which is hejos in Spanish. But when John speaks of us as being the sons of God, he uses the word technon. The reason for the different words is because John, unlike some other books of the Bible, is trying to distinguish between Christ and us in that we are sons of God in a different way. When we are born into this world, we are sons of the fallen Adam, of a sinful nature, which means we are born sons of the devil. Just as Christ pronounced to the unconverted Jews in John 8, verses 44, so the question is, how do we become sons of God? The answer is simple. We become sons and daughters of God by becoming brothers and sisters of Jesus. By joining or allying ourselves with Jesus, it allows him to go before the Father and say, Father, I have a new brother or sister. For instance, if John surrenders his whole life to Jesus, then Jesus says to the Father, This is my brother John. And the Father says to Jesus, Well, if this is your brother and you're my son, then this must be my son also. Let's look at Hebrews 2.10. This is where this great truth is brought to light. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Hebrews 2.10 Notice the father saw that it was necessary to make the captain of their, their salvation perfect. That means qualified for his work through suffering. The redeemed, too, will be qualified through suffering. Because, as the scripture says, ye and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12 Now read your, in your Bibles verses 11 to 18. This is what Jesus meant 
when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, verse 6. Now read Romans 8, verse 29, and notice that the Father wanted all who come to Jesus to be conformed to the image of his Son, so we can be his brethren. Next, read verse 32. He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8.32. According to this verse, beside the Father's Son, Jesus, he has other sons, those who received Jesus as their Savior. So how do we receive Jesus and become a brother and sister of Jesus? Turn to Galatians 3, 26-29 for the answer. For ye are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ. Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3, 26-29. For how do we become sons and daughters of God? By receiving Jesus. What ceremony do we go through to say we received Jesus? Baptism, the laver. When we come out of the watery grave, God looks at us as being included with Jesus, and everything the first Adam lost through transgression of the law, thereby making himself a servant of Satan, will be restored through Christ. Notice Matthew 5, 5, Bless are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now look at Galatians 4, 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. The real Israel of God is the remnant according to the election of grace. Romans 11.5 In Romans 11.17-24, Paul speaks of the olive tree that represents Israel. The branches, Jews, were broken off because of unbelief, and the wild Olive shoots, Gentiles, were grafted in to share in the nourishment of the tree. The natural branches could be grafted back into the tree if they accepted the conditions. God is no respecter of nations or persons. All who turn to him will be accepted. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Romans 10, 12. That's from the New King James Version. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 26. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done. For you. John 15, verses 5 to 7. The new Israel inherits God's covenant promises. Those who have accepted Christ become the chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Let's compare 1 Peter 2, verses 9 to 10 with Exodus 19, verses 5 to 6. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises 
of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 1 Peter 2, 9-10 Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandments, then ye shall be, future tense, a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Exodus 19, verses 5 to 6. Christ has a church, a new Israel, in every age, but only by obedience to the commandments of God are we given a right to the privileges of being a part of his church. The human race is in desperate need of redemption. God yearns to forgive and cleanse. Note John 3.16 and 1 Timothy 2.4. It is the role of the church to carry this news to the world. Have you chosen to be a part of it? Let's close with the following quote from the Pen of Inspiration. God has a church. It is not the great cathedral. Neither is it the national establishment. Neither is it the various denominations. It is the people who love God and keep his commandments. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Matthew 18, verse 20. Where Christ is, even among the humble few, this is Christ's church. For the presence of the High and Holy One who inhabiteth eternity can alone constitute a church. Ellen White, Upward Look, page 315.